We finish today this sermon series entitled Deep Change that is meant to run alongside and expand upon these chapters that we are reading together as a congregation from emotionally healthy discipleship. And the last chapter that we read together was a humdinger too. Chapter 9. I hope you felt challenged and illuminated by it. Let's begin today by talking about our culture's complicated relationship with strength and weakness. On the one hand, in 21st century America, everyone wants to be perceived as strong. Our politicians in this and election year feel as if they must be perceived as strong. And the more they feel that way, the louder they are, the more aggressive they are, and even the more abusive with their speech they become. Power corrupts, it was once said. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. It seems as if our leaders have forgotten that warning about power. But the rich have the same view of power. The more they accumulate, the more influence they have, and the more powerful they feel. And yet, were you to get to know these giants of industry, you would find they're human beings just like you and me, maybe in some ways worse. Because their power has gone to their head and their heart. And it has made their character and their will weak. Maybe as you reflect upon how our culture views power, you would acknowledge with me that so much of how we talk about power, my power, your power, the richest power, the influential's power, America's power, frankly, it just rings hollow. It seems like a giant game of pretend that we're playing with one another. We have the same kind of complicated relationship with weakness. On the one hand, we feel as if we cannot disclose any weakness to one another. Certainly those who are in the public eye, again, political leaders, those who are actors in Hollywood, tech moguls. They have all the answers, they are sure of what they say, and they cannot show weakness. And yet so often they are found to be just that, as are we all, weak. And there is this part of the American mindset that on the one hand we avoid weakness, and yet when we find out that somebody is weak, we will in time forgive them and give them a second chance. Insert the acting career of Robert Downey Jr. as a great example. We have a complicated, confused relationship with these ideas of strength and weakness. There's a United Church of Christ pastor, Kenneth Samuel, who's in Georgia, who talks about how as Christian people, we get to cut through that fog and have our perspective on both strength and weakness transformed by the message of our faith. He says it this way, quote, for many years of my life, I thought that the portrayal of power meant the downplay of weakness. I gravitated toward depictions of my own faith that promulgated proclamations of spiritual invincibility. But I've come to realize at long last that a spotlight on victory without the corresponding reality of vulnerability was not a true representation of anyone's experience. There is no strength without struggle. <laughs> 
It is precisely the acknowledgement of my own struggles and weaknesses that has given me the power to connect with the struggles and weaknesses of others. And it is this shared compassion that precisely fuels authentic community. It is true that only bruised hands can bless. Only a broken heart can even hear the hurts of others. End quote. Where strength and weakness come together is a single word. And that word is vulnerability. And today, like last Sunday, I want to give you access to the best possible thinking and research on vulnerability. Last week, it was about the how-to of love, you might recall. And to do that, we need to talk about the woman who has been at the forefront of championing vulnerability and handling it well. Her name is Brene Brown. She's a research professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Houston and has been there a long time. She has the notoriety of having the fourth most viewed TED Talk of all time. Now, if you don't know what a TED Talk is, ask your kids or grandkids, they'll let you know. Her TED Talk entitled The Power of Vulnerability has been viewed as of January of this year 65 million times. In that TED Talk, which you'll get a chance to view if you haven't seen it in the email that goes out tomorrow, is based on the research she has done that's reported in her book that is pictured up on the screen entitled Daring Greatly. How the courage to be vulnerable transforms the way we live, love, parent, and lead. So what is it that Brene Brown, by the way, I should mention, she is also a Christian. She's a lifelong Episcopalian who took a detour through Catholicism at some point. She would be glad to tell you. So what is it that Brene Brown, in her lifelong study of vulnerability, has discovered? And how can it help us understand the interplay of strength and weakness that we feel every day? Well, first, we need to talk about what vulnerability is. I don't have to convince anyone in the room that we live in a vulnerable world. I should add here, everything you're going to see on this screen in the next two are direct direct quotes from her. So they're not my words, they're hers. I don't have to convince you that you live in a vulnerable world. But what does it mean to feel vulnerable? It's when you feel like, she says, you are either at risk or you are taking a risk. You are wandering out on that limb that you can feel shaking in the wind beneath your feet. It's when you feel uncertain about your circumstances, a decision you have to make, a choice you have to make. It's when you feel emotionally vulnerable or exposed or open. And the key to defining it that way is you realize that vulnerability is neither good nor bad. It just is. So often, we, especially in American culture, want to talk about vulnerability as, to quote her, a dark emotion. Something you want to run from and avoid as best you can. And vulnerability just is. So if you feel vulnerable, if you feel insecure at times, if you feel unsure at times, if you feel unsteady at times, it doesn't make you crazy. It just makes you human. This is what Brene Brown would tell you. This, by the way, is also what the Christian scriptures would tell you. From the very opening pages of the Bible, we are told that human beings are vulnerable. And the best of what happens to us and the worst of what happens to us is a result of that vulnerability. 
God in the opening chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, does not set up human beings in a world that is completely controlled or completely self-contained. Instead, what he does is set human beings forth on a mission. And that mission is to tame the world, it is to nurture the world, and it is to care for the world. Those three verbs are all right out of Genesis 1 and 2. We go forth into God's good, uncertain creation to tame and nurture and care for all that is. That's the language of contingency and vulnerability. Old King Solomon, late in his life, says in the opening verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, That we will all go through seasons when we experience our human vulnerability for good and for not so good. We will all experience times of building and breaking down. We will all experience times of dancing and mourning. We will all experience times of weeping and laughing. This is human vulnerability. The prayer and worship book of the Bible, the Psalms, crackles with the energy of vulnerability. You cannot read a Psalm without hearing human contingency, sometimes expressing itself as fear and sometimes expressing itself as faith. To be vulnerable is just to be human. To deny or avoid your vulnerability is to actually become less human. At the heart of the Christian story is a God who is vulnerable, who makes himself vulnerable to to us in the person of his son, Jesus. The story of Advent and Christmas is, at root, a story of vulnerability. The story of this day, Palm Sunday, is a story of vulnerability. When Jesus rides into Jerusalem to offer God's kind of kingdom to the world, only to see it roundly rejected a few days later on a Roman cross. You cannot be a Christian and not read your life and the great narrative God is telling in the world without vulnerability in it. One of the great Christian authors of the late 20th century, an American woman named Madeline Longle, says it this way. When we were children, we used to think that when we grew up, we would no longer be vulnerable. But to grow up is to learn to accept vulnerability. To be alive is to be vulnerable. How much of your life have you spent trying to avoid your own vulnerability? I would admit to you this morning that I think I've spent a lot of time doing that. I've spent a lot of the strength of my youth running away from being vulnerable, being able to be hurt by people, not always thinking that I had to, always thinking that I had to have the answer to whatever question I was asked. However else anybody's knees were shaking, mine had to be firm. And there is something about growing older that teaches you you cannot run away from your own vulnerability. And in fact, you can only be healthy and thrive if you learn to embrace it. But that then leads to this. Brene Brown in her research has discovered how all of us run away from our own vulnerability. Here are some of the tactics that everybody you know, including me and including you, use to not feel insecure, unsafe, or contingent in a contingent world. The first thing we do is we numb ourselves from our vulnerability. In her great turn of phrase, we armor up. We wake up in the morning and we feel as if we need to put on the metal plates and the helmet and the armored shoes just to go out into the world and make it through our day. We armor up. So much so that we will often deny the feelings that we have 
that we associate with the negative experience of vulnerability and we push our hearts and our minds toward those things and feelings that are only positive. And she discovered, here's the real problem. The more you numb yourself to how vulnerable you feel, the more you are numbing yourself to everything in life. You end up just staying in the middle of life. No highs, no lows, nothing. To take away your experience of vulnerability, you are also going to be taking away your ability to experience joy. Let's pause here. If you're an American male, this is you. And that's because our culture has a deficient, one-sided view of masculinity. And oftentimes, this view of masculinity gets perpetrated even in our Christian churches. You have to be the tough one. You have to be the one who will grind out a life in this desert of a world. You have to be strong when nobody else will be. You need to live in denial of your own vulnerability. And this is why there is a crisis of masculinity, not my turn of phrase, in America right now. Read people like Jonathan Haidt and Scott Galloway and others. Men have no idea how to be men anymore because they have thought that if I was just this, then I would be able to make it through this sometimes unsafe, insecure world, and I'm not. It's just a story and a definition that doesn't work. Are you like me as a man this morning willing to question, yeah... This whole thing that I don't really have emotion, that I don't really feel bad, I only feel good. Are you willing to say to yourself, that isn't working for me, I need to find a better way. We numb ourselves, we put on our armor, and we just soldier on. Other tactics we use. We speak in certainties in an uncertain world. We want to make things simple and black and white. We want to control everything we can, but the truth is we never can control enough. And when we feel vulnerable enough, exposed enough, contingent enough, we're going to blame somebody else for that experience. How is this not the politics of America 2024? We feel certain parts of our culture, from immigration to economics to higher education to the housing market, are all vulnerable right now. Surely it is somebody's fault, and it's not mine. This is dealing poorly with vulnerability. For the biblically fluent, what should strike you about all these terms, numb, armor, blaming, certainty, This is the language of sin. Every one of those metaphors is used in the Bible about what it means to be a broken person in a broken world. So much of human injustice and evil flows not from the heart of evil people, but from the heart of people who are handling their vulnerability oh so poorly. You see that? How do you handle your vulnerability? Are you denying it? Are you pretending to play the strong game? Are you blaming others for it? To be human is to be vulnerable. So what do you do? If it's true, biblically, and from the research of Brene Brown, that to be human is to be vulnerable, and we cannot use these strategies to avoid it, what do you do? How can you follow her turn of phrase, the pathway of vulnerability into rich, real life. It is from that phrase that the sermon title is taken. The first thing she would tell you is that you need to own it. You need to own it, and you need to face it. The most precise definition of courage 
in her work as a sociologist is simply being willing to face your own vulnerability and act. Are you willing to be courageous and own how vulnerable you sometimes feel? I have not, over the course of my life, always kept a journal. It's actually one of my regrets. I wish I had been more faithful in it. I have been for the last year or so, though, keeping a journal. And in that journal, there are certain things that I focus on, not every day, every other day, every third day. And her advice is one of the things I journal about. I focus on how vulnerable I have felt. And I need to tell you, there are times it brings me to a full stop. There are times I cry at how vulnerable I feel. How I can't handle one more person complaining and saying it's my fault. How I can't take one more blowhard thinking they're certain about things that are uncertain. How I just can't take people who think they know the answers when the very obvious fact is none of us know the answers. And it brings me to tears. But I believe what she has found that if I don't own those feelings, they are going to own me. And the best thing I can do is write and pray, and as I do, offer them up to God and say, this is me. I am not hiding. Heal this, help this, so I can help heal and help others. Own it. And then show up as a vulnerable person. Show up to your committee meetings, show up to your Sunday school classes, show up to your small groups, show up to your job, not as the person who knows best, not as, the, not as the person who has thought it through so well that everybody else just needs to bend the knee and heed what you say. Show up as a person who's willing to say, I'm vulnerable, I am incomplete, I don't get it all and I need your help. Woody Allen once said, 90% of life is just showing up. Brene Brown would say he was right. But the willingness to show up vulnerable to people is a courageous act. Are you willing to do that? She says you also need to recognize that most of what you crave in life comes from your vulnerability. Your vulnerability is the cradle of those things. You cannot love anyone without being vulnerable. You can't be creative or try something new if you're not willing to be vulnerable. You can't connect with another human being if you're not willing to be vulnerable. You cannot feel belonging anywhere if you're not willing to feel vulnerable. So often we interpret the signals of feeling unsafe or unsure or at risk in an entirely negative way, and instead we need to see them as the doorway and the path to the life we really want to live. This is the life of faith. You don't get to live as a Christian every other way without faith. No, the Christian, faith, the Christian life is a life of faith. It takes me trusting and moving in a direction when I cannot see entirely where I will go. It is me believing that God is right and faithful and true, and that if he tells me I need to move in this way, then it will be worth it in the end, even if I can't figure out how. It is in your vulnerability that you will find the cradle to the life that you want. You need to leave here this morning asking yourself, what risk have I been avoiding that God wants me to take? How does God want me to trust Him in a way that I have been unwilling to do? How does He want me to extend myself or stretch myself in a way that may make me feel afraid? How? The life you want is at the other side of using your vulnerability well. And of course, this is one of the best definitions of church you're ever going to hear. What are we trying to do here? 
We're trying to have a, a bang up worship service so more and more people come. We're trying to have a beautiful facility in sight so people will love what they see when they come in. Okay, sure. But no, fundamentally what we're trying to do is build something, maybe the only place in our country that is safe for each other where we can be vulnerable. Where I can be known and you can be known and you are safe in doing so. And that takes work. You want to know why you did a book this Lent that challenged you and pushed you? It is so you would become safe for each other. And you would be able to be vulnerable with each other. Maybe it will be the only place in your life where you can be. There's an Irish poet and philosopher, one of my favorite poets, in fact, by the name of David White. David White has written extensively on the human phenomenon of vulnerability. And I want his words to be the last thing that you hear today. He writes, Vulnerability is not weakness. A passing indisposition or something we can arrange to do without. Vulnerability is not a choice. Vulnerability is the underlying, ever-present, and abiding undercurrent of our natural state. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to be something we are not and most especially to close off our understanding of the grief of others. More seriously, refusing our vulnerability, we refuse the help needed at every turn of our existence. The only choice we have as we mature is how to inhabit our vulnerability, how to become larger and more courageous and more compassionate, through our intimacy with it. Our choice is to inhabit vulnerability as generous citizens of loss, robustly and fully, or conversely, as misers and complainers, reluctant and fearful, always at the gate of real life, but never bravely and completely attempting to enter never wanting to risk ourselves, never walking fully through that door. Would you pray with me? Our good God, on the one hand, we readily acknowledge to you that we are vulnerable people in a vulnerable world. And yet you got to know there is a part of us that doesn't like it. And we question your arrangement of things that leaves us feeling so insecure, unsafe, at risk so many days. Lord God, we're human. That makes us vulnerable. Help us not misuse our vulnerability to hurt ourselves or others. Forgive us for the many times that we have, run, we have run from it. And today and this week and going forward, help us lean into our own vulnerability as the path to real divine life. And God, help us as a church create a space in which people are safe to be vulnerable because there are not many spaces like that in America right now. Lord God, we lift this to you and we ask it for the sake of your enduring, evolving, emerging kingdom. Amen.